Joining us now, it's an honor to have him with us, Dalton Reisner. Uh, Minnesota Viking, you know, free agency doesn't start for a while, so we're still labeling you as one of ours. But first off, thank you so much for coming in. Yeah, no problem, man. I'm happy to be here. I am technically a Viking until March, so I'm going to continue to soak that in. I'm going to wear the colors. I'm going to uh, take ownership of being a Minnesota Viking for a few more months, even though the season's over. So thanks for having me in. All right, let's talk about this season. I mean, it has to be the craziest season. I know you've only been in the league five years, four or five years, but that had to be just chaos, not only just for you, but once you got here with all the different quarterbacks. And how does that change things for an offensive lineman when there's a different person back there barking out the cadence? Well, you're right. I mean, this year was chaos. I mean, to start, you know, I'm in Colorado, September 18th, finishing up a workout. I got my cleats on. I'm, I'm getting some sets in at the park, just wondering when my fifth year is going to get started and what's going to happen. And I get a call and four hours later, I'm on a plane to Minneapolis. I'm in full pads the next day practicing with the Minnesota Vikings. Right. And that was complete chaos. My wife is getting a U-Haul and bringing it across the country <laughs> and we're getting moved into an apartment and just, we brought the bare essentials and happened to rent furniture and Three, weeks, three or four short weeks after showing up, it's Monday night football against the best defense in the NFL, <laughs> and I'm starting as a left guard for Kirk Cousins and the Minnesota Vikings, so um, that right there is already chaos. But what an amazing year, my favorite year in the NFL. What an amazing story. Um, it'll probably take me a long time to describe why I feel like it's such an amazing story, but I felt a lot of redemption this year. Um, but in terms of the quarterbacks, unfortunately, in my five years in the NFL, I've never had a season where I get to block for one quarterback. There has been really? quarterback injuries. Just We went through, I think we had four different quarterbacks this year. Yep. In Denver, two out of my four years there, I had four different quarterbacks. Oh, so This is old hat then. Unfortunately, <laughs> I am used to this. Um, it's usually been because of injury, which is unfortunate. But um, years like this are tough. They are chaotic. The highs are high. The lows are low. And that's exactly what this year was. I mean, you, you look at Atlanta with Josh Dobbs coming back with no time left and winning the game. And then you, you look at, you know, our stretch after the bye week. And, you know, we beat the Raiders the first game, but we go to overtime versus the Bengals. And then we play a Detroit team, you know, trying to win the NFC North that is a playoff team that is a good football team. And we lose at home by six points. We have an opportunity to win the game, you know, with 30 seconds left. So... Chaos is exactly the right word, and the truth is, as an offensive lineman, it's very tough when you have different people back there every single week. But as it being very tough, I will also admit that we get paid to be professionals, and our job is to be offensive linemen. And we don't get a guarantee that says, you will block for Kirk Cousins all year, and this is how it will be. No, you sign up for the NFL, which is anything can happen, and next man up mentality. All right, let's go back to your story. and getting here to Minnesota, yeah. you were almost lobbying to be a part of this team <laughs> saying, hey, you, you, you need a body, I'm a body, let's make this happen. Um, how tough was that? Because you were so great in Denver and your career was off on such a great trajectory. You must have been saying like, what? Yeah. How, how am I how am I sitting here yeah. in a park, like you said, doing workouts by myself? <laughs> yeah, I know. There's like people and kids staring at me like, what's that grown man doing with cleats in this park? Like, this is where kids play. What is he doing? Um, one thing a lot of people don't know, and I'm sharing this with you, is I could have been on 16 different NFL teams. It was just that I felt like with what you just said, my four years in Denver, 62 starts and my resume, right. not only with what my agent said, but a lot of publications and what the, the world was kind of saying is I'm one of the top free agents out there. And I really believed that even if the world didn't say it, I believed I, I was. And the contracts that I was being offered were not replicating that. So I could have been on multiple teams. A lot of okay. people think Dalton, no one wanted him, right? Yeah. Six, I could have been on 15 or 16 different teams. In fact, I was going on a visit two, two days after when I actually signed to Minnesota to a different NFL team that was going to sign me. It was all about me saying I feel like I am worth a different number. So that was the main issue throughout the offseason was teams, you know, it was the business side of it. Sure. Teams saying, hey, this is what we'll offer, and me saying, I think I bring more to the table. And one might have told me back in August, well, you know, you should just, just go get on a team. But what I felt like I was able to prove this year as a Minnesota Viking and what you were able to watch me do and the Minnesota Viking fans were able to watch me do is why I was sticking to my worth. It's because I feel like I bring a lot to the table, not only 
the ability to be a left guard in this league and be a consistent starter that they can depend on, but my consistency, being able to play through injury, being tough, my leadership, trying to be a good guy, a good character in the locker room. So that was kind of where the story got tricky. I was asking those questions of what the heck is going on? <laughs> yeah. Why why won't team why are teams trying to get me for this? Why would you know this other guy got paid that? Why can't I be right there? And it was truly humbling, um, very, very humbling. And I'm a big believer in Jesus. I had my hat, my yeah, tattoos, right. you guys know that. Yep. And it was just one of those deals that I felt like God was working through me and teaching me a lot of lessons, me and my wife both. So as I will say, it's a redemption story. Those six months of not having a job, watching OTAs, watching camp, um, they were very, very hard. But like I said, Minnesota Vikings swooped in on the 18th and uh, they made it happen, which was huge. All right. We're going to show a play from this season, and I think this kind of exemplifies what you bring to a, a football team. This was against New Orleans. This was a third and five. Dobbs is the quarterback. He's running for his life. You're kind of just watching here all of a sudden, and Dobbs flips it out, catches made. Then the Saints trying to take him down, and there's you absolutely <laughs> annihilating them. And then the kick. Then the kick. All right, you take us through what's going on. Well, this is a pass play. As we know with Joshua Dobbs, he made a lot of things happen. And <laughs> you always got to block to the whistle. But one thing I really pride myself on. Here he comes. Oh, there it is. And then hamstring popped right there. <laughs> one thing I always pride myself on, and being a kid from a small town of 800 people and just having a dream to play in this league is I promised myself the first day as Minnesota Viking that when the season was over, so today, I'd be able to look back and say I emptied my tank. And I'd be able to look back and say that I put everything into this season. And I look back and that's, that, that's what I did, man. A play like that shows I'm not going to take one play for granted in the NFL. And I do that because of what that six months was like without a job and watching guys that I'll just tell you plainly, I felt like I was a better football player than, and they're in the NFL. And I'm like, man, like if I get an opportunity to be a starter in this league again, I'm going to really empty my tank and show the world why I feel like I should be in there. So I think it came from a place of I'm going to take pride in being a Viking and there won't, there won't be in a, a way for me to look back and say I didn't give it my all. And I wanted coaches to see that. I wanted fans to see that. I wanted my teammates to see that. I mean, I made the joke to my teammates. I said, uh, look alive. Ever, if you're ever downfield and someone's trying to tackle you, <laughs> throw the ball back to me. I'll score a touchdown, man. I'll be down there. And when JJ first came back, I said, I'll be there. Don't you worry. If someone's about to tackle, it, tackle you, 66 is going to be down there by the pile. So um, I guess I just took pride in emptying my tank. Yeah, well, I think you knocked over a half dozen players. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really cool, man. I love that play. I won't really like that clip, so I'm going to have to have you get that to me. I, will, I, I that. will get that to you because <laughs> yep. it, it kind of just shows, you know, the effort where there's a lot of players that would just say, okay, well, that's 10 yards away. Yep. My portion of the play is over. And that shows, no, it's never over until the whistle blows. The, the beautiful part of that play is I got to actually make an impact with hustling downfield. I don't know if you watched other plays, but in that game and throughout the rest of the season, a lot of the times, I'd say 90% of the time I sprint down, the play's over. And all I can really do at that point is help my teammate up, or they're already up and I just pat them on the helmet. So... <laughs> Those plays are tough because you're, you're using extra energy, and now I'm a 315-pound man hustling. <laughs> I'm breathing hard for the next play. So a lot of the time it's hard, but plays when you get to actually make an impact downfield make it all worth it. And if someone could tell me you're going to hustle all year, but you get to do that play and push TJ five yards ahead, kick, and U.S. Bank Stadium goes, <laughs> stadium goes crazy, I'd do it all over again, man. It was worth it. <laughs> it's awesome. Well, I know that I've talked to other players that have said, uh, Dalvin Cook last year scored on like an 80 yard touchdown and he almost got taken out by one of his linemen and he was the first one to congratulate him and he's like how is this possible that he's here <laughs> and so it does register with them that you guys are always in it no matter what's going on yep and that's our job as offensive linemen is for us to be selfless how can we do everything we can put our bodies on the line so our teammates can get in the end zone and get cheered on. That's the job as an offensive lineman. And we're most likely only going to be noticed when we make a mistake. When a yellow penalty is thrown or we give up a sack or someone beats us and they tackle the running back in the backfield, um, our job as an offensive lineman is to not be noticed. So, yeah, it's good when we're not getting our name called. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, you're a nice guy. You're a man of God, right? But you want to go out there on Sunday and absolutely annihilate that person that's lined up across from you. How do you turn that switch? What happens on Sundays at noon? You know, my dad was my 
peewee football coach, my middle school coach, and my high school football coach. I have four brothers. I'm one of five boys. He coached all of us. He started the peewee program in our small town, and yeah. he coached all of us through peewees, then became the middle school coach, then became the high school coach, coached all of us through football until we got to college. And one thing he always taught us was there was a switch, and he said, my parents raised us to be good, God-fearing men that respected women, respected people, um, were unjudgmental. They, they raised us the right way, and they told us to be good to people, and they believed in that. But he also believed in when you get to the football field, it was the switch, and when you, when you put your cleats on, they touch the grass or the turf, you flip that switch. And you went from, I'm going to be respectful and nice, to... I want to go out here and destroy somebody, right? <laughs> and that doesn't mean you're saying bad words and being a bad person on the field, but it does mean you have a job to do as an offensive lineman and it's to crush the guy in front of you. <laughs> and that's kind of what I've always taken with me is I know I spoke about why I hustle, but I really, this job is really important. This job is hard to get. Only a 0.1 percentage gets to play in the NFL. And then of that percentage, only a certain amount of guys, there's only 32 left guards in the NFL. So I'm one of 32 left guards in the world. There's a lot of people out there that want to have my job, that want to take my job. So I'm going to flip that switch and take it very serious. There's no time to be nice. There's no time to say, I love you and shake your hand. After the game, that's fine. But when we're in between those white lines and the clock is going, uh, I got a quarterback to protect, a running back to protect, a team, teammates, coaches, an organization to make proud, and I take that serious. All right, hopefully the Vikings get a deal done with you here before you get to free agency. Yes. But if you do get to that again, how different will it be for you now that you've experienced what you've experienced? Will it be not as self-doubting perhaps? Will it be, you know, I know I could do the job and I'll, I'll get something? Or what's your approach this time should you get to that in March? Yeah, you know, I'm right there with you. I hope I don't get there. I want to be a Minnesota Viking. I want to be a part of what this area has going on, what the Minnesota Vikings has going on. I want to be around the Juicy Lucy a little bit longer, not going <laughs> to lie to you. Um, shout out Matt's Bar, the French yes. fries there. Oh, my gosh. And uh, But if I do get to free agency, I think that one thing that will change, one thing that wouldn't change is me knowing my worth, me knowing the type of player I am. Now I have I've done it for five years, I've done it 73 starts in the NFL, two different organizations. I mean, I came in here on the deal that I had, with, they already had an entrenched left guard that had been here for four years. And when I got my shot to play in San Francisco, I think that I proved to them that I could be their guy here so much that, you know, they ended up going the direction with letting me start. And Ezra Cleveland is a great left guard. He's gonna, he had success in Jacksonville, and he's going to have great success. But I just feel like I've proven to myself, like you said, I can do this. So I'm going to continue to have that, that respect and know my worth and say, hey, this is what I think I deserve. But at the same time, you know, when teams come calling, I think I'm going to be much more proactive. I really don't want to be at a park in September working with my cleats on, having kids stare at me. I'd much rather move to somewhere in March or April and get going with the team with OTAs. So um, I don't know what God's got in store, but I sure hope it gets done quicker this year. All right. This team, you said you wanted to stay here, and you said a big part of that was the chemistry, the camaraderie, the feel of the organization. Can you... Share a little bit more. Is it teammates like Cousins and Jefferson and Harrison Smith? Or what is it about the Vikings that you like so much? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. I've, I'm not a Wiley vet that's been on five, six teams in the NFL. It's only my second team. But I can tell you from my experience in Denver for four years, which great organization. I grew up a Denver Bronco fan. Grateful for the Broncos, always will be. But getting here to Minnesota, it's from the top down. And I know I said that in my interviews all year. What I meant by that is ownership. You know those NFLPA votes on the players and how they rate the facility and the food and everything sure. and how yeah. Minnesota was number one? It is no doubt that it is. The, the food that we get served there, the way that they take care of the families, the way that my wife was taken care of and how the Minnesota Vikings made sure that she was taken care of, the player development with Les Pico and helping us get into an apartment and just they have a huge organization that just it helps people. And me showing up in September – it made it so easy and the drinks that were supplied and the snacks and the way that Kevin O'Connell runs his program and the way practices are ran and the way that the coaches care about the players and the trainers and the strength staff and everyone's on the same page and it's all the Minnesota Viking way and owners are in there after the game owners are in there for team meetings like it just was different I'm like okay they take it very serious around here they 
are all on the same page. They care about us as players. They want us to be successful. They're going to give us every resource to make us successful from the food that we're eating, from strength and conditioning, to training, to sports performance, film study, the, the, the cleanliness, the size of our meeting rooms. I mean, I could go on and on. <laughs> that is, TCO is a crazy spot. And I think that's what I mean by it. And not only that, but the biggest part is the culture. And the culture starts with everything that I just said, but it also starts with the general manager and who he's bringing in to be on the football team. I said it all year. When you're an elite player like Justin Jefferson, Daniil Hunter, and Kirk Cousins, maybe there's some more elite players I'm forgetting, but those are the first three that come to my mind that in my mind are elite. Harrison Smith as well. Right. Those are the elite players on the Minnesota Vikings football team. They carry themselves as our teammates, same level. And I have never witnessed that. I'm used to, if you're an elite player, you kind of hold your nose above everyone else and you kind of, you walk a different walk. You carry yourself a different way. Dude, Justin Jefferson, Kirk Cousins, Daniel Hunter, I could go up to those guys at any point and just chat with them. I'm not elite. I, I view myself as a good football player, but I'm not elite. And for them to, you know how much more I want to hustle downfield and help pick up Justin Jefferson because of the way he carries himself? That's one of the best wide receivers in football, yet he carries himself so humble. Kirk Cousins, too. Um, the man of God that he is, Daniel Hunter, he's Oh my gosh, like that dude was created in a lab. I mean, I'm low key scared of him when I talk to him, man. But it just, that culture was created because of the people they bring in and the type of character they have. That's by far one of my favorite things is walk around that locker room and the character that those guys have. Well, you are elite because you're one of 32. Heck Remember yeah, I appreciate that. that. I appreciate you're, that. You're right there. You're right there. <laughs> and one other thing that, that makes you elite is the way you've given back. You were only here for a short time. Yet in December, we caught up with you and you were ringing the bell for the Salvation Army. I mean, for you to get involved in a place where you're just trying to get your feet on the ground and like you said, figure out, oh, is this my furniture or is this rented? You know, <laughs> what, what's going on here? But to take that time to use your platform to step out like that, why is that so important to you? Yeah, I appreciate you asking. Um, man, for so many reasons, it's important to me and this is probably gonna shock some people, but. What I do off the field and the impacting of lives is more important to me than the game of football. And I say that because if in 10 years you're talking to somebody and you're talking to my kid and you tell them something about me and you, you say that I was a really good football player as opposed to if you told them about the heart that I had and the way I impacted people in this community, the, the latter would, would mean so much more to me because I think that's a legacy that I wanna leave is this world needs more athletes willing to get up here and admit that football is going to end someday. Football will be over. No one will want my autograph anymore. I'm not going to go to lunch and someone say, hey man, like Dalton Riser, get a picture, you know, sign our wall. No one's gonna care about who I am, right? I'm, unless you're a Tom Brady that, you know, you break NFL records and you play for 40 years. Right. And the way I feel at 28, I don't know if I got 20 <laughs> more years left in me. Um, the legacy that I think lasts is how you treat people. The legacy that I think Last is the impact that you make on people's lives. I come from a family that I remember Christmas presents getting dropped on our doorstep. I remember snakes living in my house. Like we, my mom and dad, my dad worked three jobs. My mom had five children under the age of six years old. And yeah, that was their choice to have that many children that quick. But at the same time, they worked really hard, but they, they had to live within their means and they didn't have a lot. And I always promised myself that if I got into a situation where I could set myself up, I wouldn't use it just to put myself on a pedestal. One, I'd put Jesus on a pedestal because I'm blessed and thankful and I wouldn't be here without him. And at the same time, I wanna be able to help people. I wanna be able to impact people's lives with the blessings that I have. I wanna help families like my family who could have used the help from someone like me. So that's why I have my foundation. That's why I came here and got to work right away. Sometimes it's just ringing the bell at the Salvation Army. I mean but maybe I had an impact on one person that night. Maybe I had more people donate so that that can go to more families in the area of the Twin Cities. You never know. So I think that's why it's so important to me. Obviously, I think that with football, it gives me a platform to make impacts. Right. So football is incredibly important. I take my job so important, but I'd have to say that the way that I treat people, the impact I make on people's lives, I think is a le legacy that I'm more proud of. Dalton, thank you so much for doing this. Hey, no problem, Appreciate man. it. Quasi. Get the checkbook out. <laughs> this guy needs to stay here with the Vikings. Thank you so yeah. much for doing this. We hey. really appreciate it. Skull, man. I can't wait. I hope I hear the Skull chant in U.S. Bank Stadium one more time next year. That would be awesome.